you need to un unmute Mark. Always the case. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'll just get this going. Uh, okay. So um, uh, I, I'm going to um, aim to speak for 25 minutes or so to allow time for any questions or clarification. Um, I'm English, as you can tell. Um, I have a particular English accent uh, as well. And sometimes when I uh, get excited um, about ideas, I, I start to talk quickly. Um, so if there's anything that gets lost in my presentation, then uh, hopefully there'll be some time there uh, and, and uh, see it as me rather than uh, you. If there's a, uh, anything that's not uh, quite making sense, that will be down to me, uh, likely, rather than yourself. Um, and I said um, I can tend to speak quickly when I get excited. So one of the things that I get excited about uh, is thinking around the complexity of professional development. Um, so I'm very uh, happy to have been asked to do a presentation um, on this uh, today. Um, and this is what I will cover um, or aim to cover, not uh, probably an equal amount on all of those parts. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be focused more on uh, theoretical uh, constructs, background ideas, rather than uh, particularly illustrations of practice. Um, uh, but hopefully that will give a basis for then for you to have a conversation um, around your practice in relationship to professional development and ideas around complexity. Um, and that's uh, the reflective questions that um, I'm going to suggest um, that you could discuss when you go into breakout rooms. Okay, so that's the that's where we're going. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit about um, my background. Uh, recently, um, I was asked with colleagues to do a uh, what was called an horizon scan of international developments in mathematics education, um, which is my background in terms of teaching in school. I was a secondary maths teacher, then a maths teacher educator, and now really i'm a researcher um mostly is what i do is research in different ways um so yeah so we were asked to do this horizon scan and we looked across um developments internationally not particularly denmark but uh in depth but i think enough um in the horizon scan to know that there are similarities and differences around tendencies within education and teacher education and teacher professional development um, internationally, some of which um, I imagine are um, influencing your experiences in Denmark, and some of them will be different. Um, so I thought it was helpful to just very briefly talk about the policy landscape in England, because it helps you, I hope, to then understand my positioning and um, part of a complexity perspe perspective is to think about situation, to think about context and how that shapes and influences the lenses, the perspectives, the way that we understand things. I know these are uh, obvious, perhaps obvious things to say, but I think important. Um, so anything that I say um, is coming from that um, English experience, experience in England. Um, one thing that's sometimes misunderstood um, about um, the UK is that although we have a single UK government, the education systems are different in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, and there's quite a bit of divergence now between England and uh, Scotland and, and, and now more recently Wales as well, who have been taking a, a different path. Um, on curriculum, on teacher professional development. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying here applies very much to England, less so to other UK nations. So um, you can see the slide. Um, the GERM uh, acronym comes from uh, Solberg, um, 
global education reform movement, uh, which has many different parts to it, um, but marketization, neoliberal agendas, but also uh, in many instances, more state control of um, teaching, of education uh, and of the profession. And, and that might be something uh, that resonates for you, uh, where you may see both uh, more political direction of the teaching profession, but also influences of marketization, competition. Um, you, you may not have had that uh, to the same, same extent that we have had that. I, I know that that's a, a tendency in, in Norway, uh, particularly, but perhaps hasn't reached Denmark quite as much. We also connected to that. I'm going to the to the bottom left now. Um, what could be called a technicist view of teaching. Um, so the teacher is technician, rather than um, a more professional or professionalized view of teaching, in which the teacher is making. Um, sophisticated professional judgments. So we, we have this tendency in England to a more technicist view recently, the last 10 years. Uh, and that is um, exemplified by two policy documents, which become very powerful in initial teacher education and early professional education, what's called a core content framework and an early, early career framework. And the view of teaching within that is, um, that there's a narrow uh, view of evidence, um, direct instruction, um, knowledge rather than skills, emphasis, um, a, a big strand, fairly strange strand uh, that's come in to English education for, that would be another seminar, around a particular interpretation or reading of insights from cognitive science and then applying it into the, into the English education. So there's a lot of talk about cognitive load theory, um, reducing working memory. Recently, this has started to come into views of teacher professional development as well, that what teachers need is lots of practice, of skills, um, uh, and that's how you make teaching better, rather than uh, perhaps a more agentic form of teacher professional learning, where it's about supporting teachers to make um, decisions and to work collaboratively with each other to develop the curriculum and develop practice. Um, so, uh, and connected to that is, um, this is, no one's quite said this yet, so this is a bit off, off the press, paper I'm working at the moment, saying that in England we're starting to get the emergence of a national pedagogy. So we've had a national curriculum for about 30 years, uh, but we now, when we've put together what the school inspectorate is doing, what's happening in terms of government direction of initial teacher training and professional development, um, and the way they support and what they support in terms of funded professional development programs, that we have this emergence of this national pedagogy, uh, which is along the lines of what I've just spoken about, direct instruction, emphasis on knowledge, and um, uh, quite a, a behaviorist uh, take on uh, neuroscience. Um, uh, approach. Um, I'm perhaps not painting a picture which is making any of you think, oh, I want to move to England to come and work here <laughs> so, <laughs> with this. Um, um, I'll be interested later in the conversation to hear how resonance this is or different to uh, your situation. Um, and then alongside that, with some tensions with some of that, what I've just described, uh, um, uh, um, the what works and evidence informed education is very uh, strong in England. Um, and that leads to, um, uh, in the last seven or eight years, quite a lot of funding of programmes um, that either are professional development programmes or involve teacher professional development and that are being, uh, and that, that have quite a relatively rigorous evaluation, uh, particularly through quasi experimental methods, randomised control trials. So that's the landscape um, that I'm coming from. And then in forms of what of some of what I'm saying, um, and the the green part in the middle is uh, myself and um, my research colleagues in our centre at Sheffield Hallam University. Uh, some of what we do. 
So we're doing some of that mixed methods program evaluation. So we um, manage and run and undertake randomized controlled trials to evaluate programs and use other methods for program evaluation of professional development. Um, we also develop ourselves what we call knowledge, in our jargon, knowledge exchange programs. So designing professional development, designing programs ourselves as uh, developers. Um, we do work on theorizing teacher professional development and teacher professional learning. Um, currently, one of the major focuses there is about the implementation of professional development programs, um, which is, um, we're gonna be reporting out probably next year on that. Um, and um, we also, in terms of evaluation theory, uh, like to think we make a critical contribution because although we uh, undertake randomized control trials, we have done evaluation and development work for the What Work Center to support them in their practice. So we're evaluating the people who are funding the evaluators, if you like. Um, we're not uncritical about that whole notion of evidence informed teaching or what works or um, what I've got a reference further down the slides, what uh, a couple of colleagues, uh, Mike Caldwell and Kathy Burnett, have written about as the inter, I, I, I always trip over this word, interventionization of education. So in that what works implementation science model, you have interventions, programs get called interventions, an attempt to intervene into the system for a program, uh, and and that is troubling to us, even though we are supporting that in, with evaluation of those programs, um, because the wider impact or the wider consequence of viewing teaching through this lens of intervention um, is problematic which will lead me to this question which i'm going to pose these questions and i'm not going to particularly talk about them but this question will come back to you for you to discuss in your groups um, because i was asked i think the, the seminar as a whole is titled excellence in professional development so that word excellence is in there so I, I just wanted to uh, reflect back um, the need to problematize the notion of excellence. In England at the moment, part of that um, germ, global education reform movement, the, it shows up with the ideas of excellence uh, in problematic ways. Excellent teaching or excellent schools. Or in higher education, we have a... Um, research excellence framework where we have research gets judged as is it excellent or not um, um and and there's some quite difficult things about that I, i'm not saying we shouldn't strive for excellence but i think there's some unpacking what do we mean by excellence what what's um or, or do we want other words uh, one word that we have that comes a lot in our work is effective is a professional development program effective um but we also might want to think about words for quality of professional development that come from other perspectives so i have the word worthwhile is it worthwhile um and um i know that jan's going to speak um a little about time I, I believe and the issue of time in professional learning um i don't have this reference here but if anyone's interested i can dig it out afterwards uh, when i come to the word worthwhile there's a a maths educator in, in Canada, who at this moment, I haven't got this written down, his name escapes me, I'll, I'll do the proper reference later, it'll come back, um, who um, works on professional development and teaching generally, um, draws on Gadama uh, and hermeneutics and talks about if it's worthwhile, then it's, it's worthwhiling. So it's a play on words in English. While means time. So you wait a while. Um, so whiling is an old word that's dropped out. And if you're whiling away, whiling time away, it means doing things quite slowly. So, yes. Uh, and this is important when we come to complexity because um, if we move away from a technicist, teacher's technician notion, of the teacher as an object of professional development to see the teacher as subject of professional development 
then the purpose and values influence participation, engagement outcomes. Indeed, I would go as far as to say that if you have a teacher that has um, a particular set of values around learning and education um, that is focused on worthwhileness of learning for the learner, as opposed to perhaps a teacher who's got values focused on exam outcomes, then even if they have the same professional development experience, they participate in the same programme, that programme is not the same programme for them. It will mean something different and uh, the content of it will mean different. And so there we get a complexity. We're getting a, a loop between the teacher as a, as a person, as a holistic person and the programme. Quick little bit on complexity perspective. Um, there's different lists and different descriptions and different models for what makes um, a system complex. Um, so here's one grouped together into four parts. With the, the uh, I could probably do this better as a graphic with the, the top two, the interconnected elements and the nested systems, leading to the non-linear and the dynamic because in a way if if you've got interconnected elements not just a way if you have interconnected elements and nested systems then you get non-linearity and you get dynamism it flows in, indeed i think probably i'd go as far to say if you have any one of those four the other three uh will come along with it so any one of those it is probably enough um as a condition for a complex system. Um, so I'm, I'm saying that in a seminar, I'd, I'd, I'd want to think about that before I wrote it down and put it out for, for people to critique as a, as a written claim. But I, I think it's, it's, it feels uh, that's a reasonable uh, viewpoint to, to take. So interconnected systems, nested systems, um, nonlinear dynamic, I, I maybe be unpack some of those ideas as we go through the next part. So here's an example um, from, a, from the Twitter sphere. It says hello, Twitter sphere. So I had this tweet come through to me, and I was named in it, um, asking for my view on this, which is how I, how it, it, it came across. So I feel, given that it was a message to me, it feels okay for me to to share this and to riff off this. So this is a really interesting um, uh, message to receive because it, it, it talks about wanting research that examines the impact of receiving some amount of booster refresher follow-up training so one thing to say about this this is in that what works evidence-based practice perspective that's where it's come from let's have research that does that impact of receiving um it also fits with that technicist view of professional development i'll go to the next slide so you can see what i mean there so if we unpack what's the underlying view of professional learning that's implied within that tweet, we have a professional development program, we might have an initial change in practice, and then this idea of booster. How did, how did she put it? How did they put it? Refresher follow-up, yeah. Booster or a refresher or follow-up. That you'd go back and you do a bit more of a follow-up, and then you get more change or reinforced change, and then you'd get impact or more impact. Um, now that's a very different idea of what that uh, booster, the, the why you would come back together and meet again with the people who had facilitated your professional learning or the other people who had been in the programme with you or the course with you. Um, it's a very different idea about why you would come back to meet them than if you're engaged in the professional learning community and collaborating over time. So we notice here how even the notion of time gets changed. It's like time here is more episodic in order to boost things. Revision, you know, it's this model. We will reinforce it in case they've forgotten um, because their the cognitive load was too much. You know, this is some of the language that's coming out now in England. It's very strange about teaching, I find. Um, um, but that's very different than We'll have a PD program. We might expect there to be an initial change in practice. Let's have bring people back together in order to talk and learn and see what they've done with that and understand the variation and the variability 
of the changes in practice that we would expect to occur from professional learning where we're supporting uh, teacher knowledge, um, teacher agency, um, the capacity to experiment professionally, as opposed to being experimented on as the subject, being the person experimenting rather than the, the uh, person being experimented about. Um, the, the second um, idea, I think, that's contained in that notion of a PD programme that's in, assumed in that in that tweet um, is that uh, here it refers to policy innovation, but it, it, it could be a um, professional development policy innovation. But this idea that um, a, a programme, a professional development experience is like a seed. And you're going to plant that in the in an environment or maybe the teacher carrying the new knowledge from the professional development program is a seed that's going to get planted back so this, this is quite this notion um and that's going to grow and you can then explain what happens as an unfolding from the principles that were contained in the initial program or the initial uh experience so there's this idea of um, uh, unfolding. Sometimes the language is used is roll out. I don't know whether you have an equivalent in Denmark. We'll 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 done this now. We're going to roll it out. It's quite it's quite an interesting idea, like a rolling. In England, I I, I don't do much um, cutting of the lawn, but in England, in the cricket, what I know the word rolling in England, they have a game called cricket, and um, there's a lot of time spent rolling or in um, tennis. They roll across the grass to flatten it. You know, it's, it's an interesting metaphor, rolling out. We're going to roll it out. Um, oh, I suppose the, the other one would be uh, in baking. We'll roll out the pastry. We'll smooth it out so we get a nice flat pastry. We don't want any rough bits. It's an interesting idea. We're going to roll out teachers. What's that about? Um, so uh, from this point of view, oh, there's a, there's a typo. There's always one, on, at least one of on my slides, apologies. It should say booster. The booster or reinforcement session is like further compost or it's watering the kernel or watering the seed. Kernel is the part around the seed. Yeah, sorry, I should have said that. That's the, the kernel. Um, but the soil itself doesn't change. But that's a very um, uh, odd idea because um, what happens in a professional de development situation is that when the teacher changes, the context changes. The professional development program itself is changing the situation. So there you get an example of complexity. It's a dynamic relationship between the teacher um, in practice, the professional development and what they do changes the situation they're in. Therefore, that's changing them. So we're getting that feedback loop. Um, I don't know whether people are familiar with this uh, model. It gets referenced a lot. Clark and Hollingsworth, um, about 20 years ago now. Um, and the reference is there. And also um, there's a paper there where we've um, not so much critiqued the model. We do do a bit of that and other models, including a uh, complexity model, uh, but also um, make an argument that it's not really about finding the best model. It's about asking questions around, is this a useful for model for me to use for this purpose? So I'm, you know, the Clark and Hollingsworth model may well be a helpful model in some situations, but may not in others. But when they first put this forward, they have these arrows and what they, their argument was different from uh, Dusky's linear model uh, of change or um, Desimone has a linear model as well of change. What they said was, um, teacher change through professional learning can happen in lots of different ways and lots of different pathways. So you can't take these four uh, aspects, the ones in the circles and the, and the rectangle, and put them in a, a, a single line and it will go from external source, change in knowledge, professional expect experimentation, and then a change in the salient outcomes. Salient outcomes for them, and they make an important point that one of the things that might change in professional learning is your idea about what 
is a good or relevant or salient outcome. So classically, you might be a teacher that thinks uh, good, a good classroom is a silent classroom, but, um, but you might, as a result of professional learning, start to think that actually a, a good classroom is a noisy classroom or a noisier classroom. Yeah. So the salient outcomes. So they're saying you can't just put these in any one order, depending on the particular professional learning, particular teacher. It could go in lots of different orders. But they're still going in order. But if we then take that a step further and then say it's not just that the order changed, but we actually read this uh, figure differently and we read these arrows as interconnected loops and feedback loops, we start to see that um, the knowledge, beliefs and attitudes are connected to professional experimentation both ways. And the external source, the external domain is connected to the knowledge, beliefs and the professional experimentation. It's not separate. Indeed, for most professional learning, I think that notion of external is really problematic. It's very problematic for um, collaborative professional learning, professional learning communities, lesson study and those type of forms because where's the externality it's the it's the teachers themselves that are the external internal neither external internal source complexity here we go um uh, and I, i've talked about the professional learning as situated um as already a little bit from the kernel um and here's this notion of nested systems. Uh, this is a model, it's a, a snapshot. How can we make sense of this? Um, but even that diagram of, of circles nesting inside each other um, in no way uh, at, properly represents the interconnection between them and how um, it's a much more fractal relationship. You could, you could put the salient systems inside the teacher practice and the local system so that in England the wider ex in school inspection system and the way that Ofsted does its work is inside the teacher's view of teaching and a view of their practice it's not just outside influencing it's become embedded and it's enmeshed and entangled uh, okay complexity leadership in Two minutes. Uh, so um, there's some references here. If, if this interests you, there's papers to follow up on. Um, myself and a colleague, uh, Emily Perry, um, coming out of a project on looking at the professional development needs of professional development facilitators and professional development leaders. So we did a, a small project for science professional development leaders specifically. Um, and so we, we we just sort of said noticed and said, well, actually, there's different things going on um, that the these uh, professional development leaders are doing. Uh, and a lot of the literature is about the facilitation of the professional development, leading the professional development program, being a teacher of teachers. But that is different than the design work and the conceptualization, the creation of the professional development program, you, that may be being done. So, I, you know, maybe that you're, you, this will be resonating with you, some of you at the moment, if you lead professional development, you might implement someone else's program they've designed. But even if you do that, you'll be making choices, design choices about how long to spend on a particular topic or when to move on. So the designer uh, role is both outside the instance, the moment of the professional learning encounter, but also can be happening within the professional learning encounter. So these roles are complex, fluid and, and intertwined, but may be helpful sometimes to pick them out. Uh, but also there's a, an important role in our marketized, um, strange, the state sets up a market and then intervenes in the market, professional learning system, that we have in England, um, also for the coordinating uh, of this. Um, Martin has done this in terms of our professional learning today, uh, in terms of coordinating um, uh, and uh, planning it, uh, and also with the support of uh, Bettina as well. And um, and brokering, you know, he he did some of this. He, he came and spoke to me and he spoke to Yad and 
um, to try and create a good professional learning experience if we see this seminar as a professional learning experience. So hopefully those roles make sense. And I'm going to invite you, another reflective question I have at the end is to invite you to think, is this useful for you? And does it help you to think about your own practice and your own work or the work of people that you work with? And then um, some notions of complexity leadership. So this comes from um, from outside education, business uh, notion, model of complexity leadership. Um, there's a, a reference there. Um, I, I find this really interesting and useful. The notions of administrative or bureaucratic leadership, uh, adaptive leadership, informal uh, and enabling leadership. Um, and that notion of the professional development leader as an adaptive leader, I think, is important because if we, if, if we ask the question, this is the missing bit. If we ask the question, how do you deal with this complexity, this interwoven systems? How do you actually find your way through to decide what to do? It's through these um, orientations to adaptation. Um, to work with the complexity and accept the complexity rather than um, see it as being like a program that can be rolled out. And at the same time, we still need administrative leadership. Things need to happen. People need to know where to go. <laughs> um, uh, people need the Zoom link. You know, it's, this is the thing that we need. Um, and then. Um, uh, oh, my slide's going a bit funny on my screen. I hope you can read this. Uh, uh, and then there's a breakdown of this. And this came out of looking at professional development leaders, uh, interviewing, looking at what they were doing um, as they uh, were trying to navigate through a system, um, their innovation role, re being responsive. I I've taken this as I put it in this uh, particular paper, but actually I think now um, reflecting on this, I, I would probably separate out the responsive and purposeful. I, I couldn't, I wanted to be true to my data and it would have been a bit too much to make a claim that they were, they should be separate categories. But actually since then, I think they should be because I think the question of purpose is so important um, because as to what you're doing and why you're doing it uh, is, is central. Um, networking, formal informal systems and and working systems themselves um so what does system work mean in that complexity of different funding models and different incentives and different priorities um and if you're a hybrid professional development leader a hybrid leader who's teaching in a school perhaps or a leader in a school but you're also a professional development leader or you're teaching in a university a research university and you're also a professional development leader um there's also the issue about how do you move between these systems so ideas of branch and crossing come into that so i think it's just about time i didn't get the five minutes for the questions um i, I think i've gone to the half an hour i hope um so i'll, I'll stop the share there and hand back oh no there, there was a yes but maybe these are going to come up anyway. Uh, okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, we will post uh, the reflection.